In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. I said I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. O Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor, miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities with which I have ever offended you and justly deserved your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them and sincerely repent of them, and I pray you of your boundless mercy and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor, sinful being. Upon this, your confession, I, by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God unto all of you. And in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty and gracious Lord, pour out your Holy Spirit on your faithful people. Keep us steadfast in your grace and truth. Protect and deliver us in times of temptation. Defend us against all enemies. And grant to your church your saving peace through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The first reading is from Revelation chapter 14, beginning at verse 6. Then I saw another angel flying directly overhead with an eternal gospel to proclaim to those who dwell on earth, to every nation and tribe and language and people. And he said with a loud voice, Fear God and give him glory, because the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The epistle is recorded in Romans, the third chapter. St. Paul tells us, Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus for all who believe, for there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Then what becomes of our boasting? It is excluded. By what kind of law? By a law of works? No, but by the law of faith. For we hold that no one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. This is the word of the Lord Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 21st chapter. Glory to thee, O Lord. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They answered him, We are offspring of Abraham, and have never been enslaved to anyone How is it that you say you will become free? Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. 
So if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to thee, O Christ. Together we confess our faith. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and descended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. On a Reformation Sunday quite a few years ago, a youngish man comes up to me and asks, Pastor, I know we Lutherans really love Reformation Sunday, but why on earth do we need to hear another sermon about God's grace? After all, he continues, isn't this a bit of a worn-out topic? I know it's Reformation Sunday, but hey, you know, it happened more than 500 years ago. And this whole thing about God's grace, you know, it was important back then. Back when, yeah, I, I understand how the teaching about good works could obliterate any idea of God's grace, but today... You know, we're looking for something different. We're looking for something about practical stuff. We need topics like, how can I get close to Jesus? Or, what must I do that Jesus is the ruler of my life? Or, how can I improve my prayer so that I am drawn nearer to God? How can I worship God so that I can feel the warmth and excitement of God's love? But did you notice in those questions, those two little words, I and me? And did you notice that the focus is on what we have to do to improve our relationship with God? Those two little words, I and me, can try so hard to overwhelm God's grace. They work extra to deny God's grace. They propel us to sidestep God's grace by our human need to do something to get God to love us or to love us more. But grace is God's undeserved love for each one of us. Grace flows from God's nature. And it's that love and forgiveness of God that makes it possible for us to be his dearly loved children. Now, it's true, God's grace in and of itself isn't fragile, but it can seem that way to human hearts, to human lives, when we try to base our salvation on what we do or think or feel rather than what God does for us. In the epistle to the Romans, the Apostle Paul reminds the Christians in Rome that God's grace is all they need. They want to add rules about what to eat and drink. They want to add techniques about being sincere in their observation of the Sabbath and other festivals. They want to add so much. And so Paul emphasizes firmly that because of Jesus, God freely accepts us. 
it is by God's grace that you have been saved. Luther had the same problems and called God's people back to the biblical concept that salvation is given totally and only through the grace of God. And today, there is an equal danger that we might think that all our hard work, our sincerity, our dedication, our commitment, our worship, our prayers, our devotion to the church, as good and as needed as all of those things are, do not misunderstand me, they are needed, but they do not make us better before God. They do not make God love us anymore. When we make those things to be of utmost importance, grace is no longer grace. Grace is only grace when it comes to us as a free gift. There is nothing that we can add to it. And let me say it to you one more time. There is nothing that we can add to God's grace for our salvation. No matter how hard we work at it, no matter how much faith we try to create, no matter how long we spend in prayer, or no matter how inspiring the worship service is, there is nothing that will save us except the undeserved love of God in Christ Jesus. Our forgiveness, our eternal life in heaven, is completely, entirely, totally a free gift of God. St. Paul says to the Romans, the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. On the other hand, God's word also reminds us that those who continue to reject Christ and his love and forgiveness remain in their sin. Sin kills. Sin has taken such a hold in our lives that even our sincerity and our best intentions, even our desire to trust in Jesus, are always blemished by sin. You know, you might look at it like a piece of beautiful jewelry that has been made, been created, been formed, and yet there is a shine that is diminished by tarnish. For all have sinned, all have been tarnished. And for us, sin isn't just something that you can wipe off, that you can clean off. The only answer for sin is God. And that's why it's so wonderful that God deals with us according to his grace. Grace is an over-the-top gift. Grace is free. Gift is forever. And it's not a matter of asking the question of whether we deserve it or not. This means that God won't remove his love from any of us because of our sin, whatever it is. I want you to take a moment and think about your sin, not someone else's sin, not the sin of the person sitting next to you or the person sitting across the church, but think about your sin. In Christ Jesus, God forgives that sin, and he will not remove his love from you. The love of God will not diminish, but it follows wherever we are. I know that most of us who've been in church for years, most of our lives, this isn't a new idea. It's central to our understanding of what the Bible has to say about God's relationship with us. But you know, at times, we even find it hard to accept something for nothing. It's hard for us to accept a gift graciously. That is, to accept the fact that we have done nothing to deserve this gift but the giver wants to give it anyway without any strings attached and any thoughts of being paid back. Even regular church-going people find it difficult at times to accept the grace of God as the solution to their problems, and not only their lives, their personal problems, but also in the life of the church. You know, as people, we find ourselves confronted by words and ideas that say, if you have faith, then God will accept you. If you give up this or that, you can be regarded as a true Christian. If you pray fervently, God will give you what you ask. If you really trusted in God, your troubles and sicknesses and worries would be over. If you are sincere and try to live the Christian life, God will bless you. But these statements, as true as they may be, as long as they are preceded by the word if, they pose a threat to the gospel. When we begin to think if, meaning if you don't do it, then you're not going to get it, 
then grace all of a sudden becomes fragile and it's in danger of being lost. God accepts us only because of Jesus Christ. There is nothing more that we can do. It has all been done for us. And let me say that in the Bible, there are certainly no objections to sincerity and obedience and repentance and piety and devotion and thought faithfulness. But God does not accept us because of them. They come as a result of God's grace in our lives. They are not the part we must play in our salvation. There is great advantage in having our salvation rest in Jesus only and not in anything on us. We find that our feelings, our trust, our sincerity, our genuineness, our repentance are very uncertain at times, and the strength of these things goes up and down from day to day and from difficulty to difficulty. But in times of struggle and doubt, there is indeed one who remains unchanged in our lives. He is the one who has made this promise of love, and he has promised to be our Heavenly Father, and he has accepted us. It is good for us to remind ourselves, I am baptized. God has accepted me in Jesus Christ. Jesus is the only one who helps in our greatest need, and that's all that counts. All by itself, without any additions, the grace of God is all we need. Now may the peace that passes all our human understanding, may it keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus unto life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray. Having confidence in our justification by grace through faith and having access to the Father in Jesus' name, let us turn our hearts in prayer on behalf of ourselves, the church, and all people according to their needs. O Almighty God, you have shown your faithfulness by raising up those in every generation who call your church to repentance and renewal. Continue to raise up voices in our own day who herald the truth of your word and proclaim the faith in purity and truth against all enemies. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Everlasting Father, you did not desire the death of the sinner, but want all to come to faith and life in Christ. Raise up faithful pastors who will preach your word without fail and teach the doctrine delivered to the saints that many may hear and believe. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of power and might, you have established governments and the order of law for the protection of all people and to preserve the freedom to worship you in spirit and in truth. Grant to those who govern us all of the humility and integrity that they need, that all may enjoy true justice and protection of life. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Holy and gracious God, your power is revealed chiefly in showing mercy to those in need. Give to the sick healing, to the troubled peace, to the grieving comfort, and to the dying peace. Hear us on behalf of all of those whom we have in our minds and hearts. According to your gracious promise, grant patience to those in tribulation and trial. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Almighty God and Father, we pray you to grant us all good things that will benefit us in body and soul and to prevent anything harmful to us or to our salvation. Teach us to live in contentment with your will and purpose and in the freedom you alone supply to serve you with all our heart and mind, body and soul. All these things we pray in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Together we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.